and and by the way, AI took us by a storm. It has come in yeah in pretty much any industry, but yeah, in, in the security industry, the AI is making its footsteps or footfalls through AI-driven security systems. And one such example being, let's say, AI-driven API security system, right? Where you send uh, an API request and the backend would apply some AI model in order to understand if the API request is a fraudulent one or not. And there are lots of different techniques of doing that. But as you can understand that AI is a big one. Namaste, everyone. I'm back with the Product Security Podcast with Sundar. In the second part, we further gone deep into how does it look like in a day-to-day life in Sundar's professional? What are the things that he deals with on a day-to-day? And what are the resources he's using to keep himself up with the technology? The biggest challenge in security as of now, the cybersecurity world and emerging threats in security. And how can an organization protect from it? Sundar has really covered wonderfully what are the different threats and how an organization can protect themselves from these type of threats. So sit back, relax and enjoy the episode. I'm your host, Ravi, and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Welcome to India's first identity podcast. Why not I A M? So the next thing is when you talk about security and uh, you did discuss about your day-to-day responsibility, can you walk us through the process of identifying and mitigating a security vulnerability in Ping Identity's product? Like, How does that process look like? Where do you find? What do you do next? Do you put up your own CV? How do you reach out to customers? At what point do you tell them? And like when I, I've seen recently, we are also putting up some patches, right? And then there is a duration given to customers like three months, six months. What makes you decide that three, six months period? In Ping Identity, what the process that we follow is, first of all, we identify vulnerability from different sources. Like it could be from code review. It could be from one of our scanners reported us something. Let's say one of our scanners you know, reported us a CVE, a critical one present in some of the third-party libraries or something like that. And we would immediately go and work with the engineering to fix it if it is a critical one or depending on the severity, mm-hmm. like I want, we would work with them and depending on the service level agreement as well, or the, in the SLO, we would go ahead and fix those. And then we would notify our customers about the vulnerability that's present in our product through something called a security advisory. So we okay. publish okay. to all our customers. And then the customers go and uh, notify their security teams to research on it and their SRE teams to upgrade the software with the patch. So that is uh, the general process, although I simplified it a lot because this is like a mm-hmm. part of the process so i don't want to get into too much of details but this is generally how it works we determine vulnerabilities from various sources and then we work with the engineers to get it fixed and once it's fixed it's pushed out to the customers and we have a service agreement with the customers right we've got a template we've got a process in place we've got a, a kind of guideline that we need to follow in order to responsibly let them know about the vulnerabilities that are present and that's what we follow essentially Okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That actually gave us a pretty good idea of how the whole process would work. Also from a customer perspective, right? Now, I know your job's been really challenging the way you have been giving us insight. Can you name three resources or three ways you keep yourself updated on the latest security threats, trends in the industry? And are there any resources or communities that you rely on? So in order to keep myself updated with the latest security vulnerabilities, the number one place to look at is the, the CVEs, right? The CVEs are the zero days that gets published. And by zero days, the CVEs that are very critical needs to be fixed as ASAP, as soon as possible. And they just come in an emergency, essentially. Yep. So research about the CVEs, researching about the exploits that was used to exploit the vulnerability in the first place teaches us a lot. For example, in case of Log4j, when the Log4j happened, mm-hmm. uh, Log4j exploit taught us a lot about how the JNDI works, for example, or the JNDI lookup works inside of Log4j, for example, right? Yeah. So researching on the CVEs and by researching, understand what the vulnerability is all about and then how the researcher found it and then how was it exploited, what the exploit looks like, okay. understanding the vulnerability inside out. And you do that for a sufficient number of CVEs and you gain a lot of experience on how security researchers work on a day-to-day basis, determining if there's a vulnerability inside of a product or not. So that's one of the things that we can do. The other thing is this website called the CISOseries.com. It's very good. It gives you all the latest news on the security. You can go and upskill yourself based on whatever the latest trend in the security uh, industry is. 
for example, one of the most recent and cutting edge uh, thing that's happening in the security right now is AI driven security, right? And and by the way, AI took us by a storm. It has come in yeah in pretty much any industry, but yeah, in, in the security industry, the AI is making its footsteps or footfalls through AI-driven security systems. And one such example being, let's say, AI-driven API security system, right? Where you send uh, an API request and the backend would apply some AI model in order to understand if the API request is a fraudulent one or not. And there are lots of different techniques of doing that. But as you can understand that AI is a big one. The other one is, for example, cryptography, like quantum cryptography. It's becoming one of those things that everybody is talking about. Like, how do we ensure that our product is quantum ready? Right? Even if we get the quantum computers, a practical quantum computer up and running, how do we ensure that the, the existing cryptography suite that we are using in our products don't get broken into? Right. So like this, if you want to understand the trend in the security, the CISOseries.com is a very good website. Okay, good, great. Thank you very much for highlighting these key resources where people can look up to for, again, being with the latest trend. The next one is, what do you see as the biggest security challenge or trends shaping the identity and access management space in the coming years? As you did mention, we have AI, we have generative AI and all of this cryptography, but from a threat perspective, what are like one or two common threats that you see is evolving every day and, and that's making the job difficult? Our organizations to manage. Well, when you talk about what are the emerging threats, right? Um, these are the ones that I talked about are the emerging threats. How we ensure that the IM products work perfectly. And then since IM product is a lot about flows, right? You do one thing after another in a series. How do you make sure that you don't exploit that? Apart from all the traditional web application security, ensuring that your client side is protected, the server side sanitization is done, there's no injection vulnerability, local file inclusion and all that stuff, right? If you think about the vulnerabilities that we face from infrastructure related issues, I think I've already covered that about the DOS and DDoS. So this is okay. a little bit repetitive. Yeah, no, that's fine. And then what I'm trying to understand here is some of the evolving threads, for example, and again, that could be the same answer, like DDoS is evolving, uh, like brute force is evolving, your uh, spoofing is evolving. It The answer could be around this only. But I'm trying to understand, one is you have threat and you have mitigated that threat. But yeah. then what, based on your experience, again, the question here is, maybe you found out that there is a threat related to brute force, which was maybe a level one that you got last year. Somehow you see that threat again, but a little bit more reward. You have to again go back and, and put control stop gap on that. Again, next year you are trying to see similar kind of thing. So I'm trying to understand if, again, based on your experience, you've seen a similar kind of threat, one or two, where every year some new variant of it, new version of it is going on evolving. And that is what organizations should be more careful about. Is there something like that that you have seen? Yeah, actually, that brings me to the point that the web application firewalls that we use uh -huh. essentially looks into an HTTP request and trying to determine if there's a known vulnerability injection payload present in the request or not. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that is like a, a cat and my, mouse race, right? Okay. Because what happens is we research on a particular CVE or an evolving threat and all that stuff, but we come up with a pattern of what the payload should look like. And we put rules in the web application firewall related to that, right? So that we can yes. stop such payloads. But then the attacker can also get very creative and write payloads that actually work, but also bypasses that check. And, and then the adversary can get very creative and then try to bypass the, the protection that we put in the web application firewall, right? Uh -huh. So that's where, again, like we have to see the, the evolved payload and then we have to put another rule or maybe modify the rule in order to cover that use case as well. So we keep uh -huh. seeing these kind of things in, in our SIAM uh, monitoring system. And it's always like we are on foot. Like we cannot entirely ensure that a rule that we have put in will always work. There are always new payloads that are coming up, the new exploits mm -hmm. that are coming up. The zero days are always exploitable because you haven't fixed them. They are out in the public. And once you have fixed them, their attack payload can change and some other vulnerability can be related, discovered related to that. Then you have to go and fix them again. So such things can happen. So these are the things I would say a security engineer should always be wary of. Okay, okay. And when you talk about uh, WAF, right, uh, can you help us give a brief understanding to all our audience about what is a WAF? So in the WSI model of networking, a network firewall 
would look into the TCP connection, right? And the IP packets, for example, the TCP parameters, the IP parameters, the MAC parameters, it would do all of that. And then it would try to determine where is the packet coming from? It can do everything up to the TCP level, right? But then you have the TLS and you have the application level data that is encrypted because of the TLS. So a network firewall does not understand the context of the application itself, right? A network firewall works on the IP address. Where is this packet coming from? How is it routed, right? Does the packet have any indicators? It's a malicious packet. That's what the network firewall looks at. On the other hand, a web application firewall looks at two levels above that. One is the okay. serial level, that is the TLS. So first of all, a web application firewall takes a packet, terminates the TLS, understands the application data. It actually reads the HTTP request, it reads the headers, it reads the, the body, the parameters present inside of the body, right? It reads the path and the parameters present in the path. And then it tries to understand whether the HTTP request that came in has some indicator of attacks or indicator of compromises in it. So that's what a web application firewall do, right? It works at the application layer level. One of the things that a network firewall cannot do and a web application firewall can do is, for example, determine a stolen token, right? If you're using a stolen token in a cookie or an authorization header, your network firewall would not stop it. But your web application firewall will be able to stop it because it knows the application data, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. what your web application firewall is all about. Okay, okay. That, that gives a very good high-level overview of, again, you did uh, beautifully cover the difference between firewall and WAF also. That makes a lot of sense. And now, this is mainly for organizations, right? Like, I know a lot of the organizations are trying to look for implementing an IAM solution, right? But at the same time, your knowledge has given a, a new perspective of how security and why security is more important. Right? So can you give... And this is for all the organization, the different leaders that are hearing these podcasts. Like what are the five security recommendations that you want to give to organization? Like, and you can cover any length and breadth. Maybe it could be around uh, like protocols to use. It could be around why should we use a WAF, how to prevent brute force, why, they're, why they should choose an on-prem versus a cloud solution, anything. Like if you can name the five best security recommendations that you want to add on. Sure. Sure, Abhi. You mentioned about top five, right? Top three, five, whichever you are comfortable. Basically, it's like a and recommendation, would, right? That we you would want. look for kind of a recommendation for the leaders, right? Yes. If they are setting up an IAM system, what mm -hmm. should they consider? Not just buying an IAM product and there will be some security along with that, but what recommendations that you want them so that they can improve their security posture while they are setting up the IAM system. Okay. Makes sense. My top... I don't exactly have five points, but maybe three or four points. The top recommendations for the IAM space would be, first of all, have your security team work in parallel with the engineering, right? Because you want your security team to give you the leverage of from, from the security side, because if a security problem arises later in your development or release lifecycle, it'll become a big impact on the business, right? So have your security team work in parallel with the engineering and let them be deeply integrated into your DevOps and release and monitoring and processing cycle, right? So that mm -hmm. the entire dev release ops process is present with the security team beside you. So that's number one. That will help you get all your pieces that are required for a, a enterprise security setup at the right time and at the right place. Okay, yeah. Yeah, and number two, I would say it's never a good idea to, not exactly never, but most of the times it's not a good idea to use either a SaaS-based IAM system or entirely on-prem, right? Always a hybrid IAM system is the better solution. And most of the customers would actually prefer that. And by hybrid, the customers get to own their identities. Their identities do not leave their system, right? There's like a, a standard mm -hmm. federation delegate server that kind of takes their identities and logs, the, logs one particular cloud system in, which is highly trusted. And then that cloud service, which in this, in case of Ping Identity would be Ping One, that Ping One would now log your customers into your cloud applications, right? But you mm -hmm. don't have to share your identity database openly in the public. You don't have to expose your Active Directory or any other directory server that you're using. So okay. a hybrid IAM system is always, most probably the best approach. And it gives them options also, right, to build their product. Like, for example, one of the use cases that I've seen is most of the applications which are SaaS, they are comfortable moving them directly into a SaaS solution. And if it is something where they need complex, there are complexities in integration or something that they have hosted in-house, for them, they would prefer on-prem IDP solution. This is 
again, not every organization uses, but one of the use cases of a hybrid IM system. Yeah, yeah, that you are absolutely right about that. Yes, it also allows them to customize how they want to share, what they want to share, and how they mm. want to design the the experience to be all of those things. So, hybrid IM system is the way to go. Okay. Yeah. And then the third recommendation would be use a proven IM technology, right? Don't try to build your own unless you are absolutely required to do. I have seen a lot of people try to build their own authentication protocols, which most of the times does not work. If we if you're not taking things like an OIDC, like OIDC is peer reviewed, community approved, and a lot of security engineers and researchers have worked on it already. You probably yeah. do not want to deviate from the specifications of OIDC. So don't try to invent protocols. Don't try to you know, build your custom protocol of authentication, authorization, or any other thing. Use the ones that are already well-established. And that goes for the products as well. If you are trying to build your own IAM tech, it might be a little bit of a, a cost-effective solution at the very beginning. But later on, you will eventually figure out that IAM, maintaining an IAM technology and developing it is very difficult. And that is a beast on itself, right? As I keep telling. Absolutely. So, yeah, it will always be almost a very wise choice to pick up a, an established and proven IM product from the market that follows the standard protocols that are already established and just use them to build your custom IS use case. That Absolutely. Be, yeah. And uh, just to add one thing, there is, again, even if companies want to build maybe as an initial step to onboard few apps, and it could be uh, budget constraints and all of that, I think that can be an approach initially. But yeah. the primary challenge comes when they will not be able to keep up with security, when they will not be able to scale up if their user population is growing, and then they will not be able to cope up if there are complexities in integration. These are the main three. And the most important one, compliance. If there are compliance requirements, I am pretty much sure homemade IAM solutions have not been able to match up to what a commercial product does. Absolutely, absolutely. And this brings me to the next point as well. Imagine a startup is just building their homegrown IAM product. Because they want, to, they have budget constraint and they want some, you know, cost cutting on that front. Even if they comply with the established standards like OIDC or SAML, these protocols are built in such a way that tomorrow you want to swap out your own IAM server with some established IAM server. The compliance, the integration is still seamless because of how you follow the protocol. Yeah. But don't try to build your own protocol is mm -hmm. what I keep telling people. Like I've seen a lot of people trying to do things like make a jot and send the jot on the client side and then verify the jot. Okay, you are done. And they call it an authentication. There's lots of complications with the jot itself, for example, right? So don't try to build your own protocol. Follow the things that are peer reviewed, community approved and followed by pretty much everyone. Follow the standards. What I keep telling. Absolutely. And that is one of the reasons why an organization would grow strong in their security posture or IAM posture by just following the standard and being updated with the compliance and security requirement. I think that is the basic that they can do, even if it is a small user base or a bigger user base for any organization. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, and I, the last point that I had is probably about the monitoring and continuous auditing. So if you're getting into the IAM space and you want to keep the monitoring alive, like you want to monitor your IAM systems and all the logins that are happening in your system, and you want to audit them continuously, right? No IAM system in this world, and I claim no IAM system, no matter who makes it, is 100% secure. Like no software as a security engineer can be claimed to be 100% secure. There are vulnerabilities in everything, right? Absolutely. So continuous auditing is ultimately what's going to stop the, let's say the 0.1% of the attacks that just don't get detected, right? So continuous auditing and you want to monitor the systems which are malfunctioning, for example. If you receive a login request that is a little bit off the track, it looks like a little suspicious. It has some kind of a not so straightforward username in it. Let's say the username is using not so well-known characters. It's trying to inject some bytes, mm -hmm. right? All of those things get detected in the WAF. And then the request comes in and you see that this particular user is trying to log in, let's say a hundred times within a span of five minutes. Those sort of indicators come in from different set sets of tools, right? So mm -hmm. we need kind of some kind of a centralized monitoring and correlating so that we can continuously audit a particular identity in context against impending uh, attacks so that we can claim that, yeah, this particular identity is behaving oddly, behavioral monitoring. All of those things are essentially, essentially the space that 
the AI-based security tool that I mentioned before are trying to mm -hmm. leverage and become an established business because what they are trying to do is essentially understand the behavioral patterns of the users and, and then see whether a particular login request deviates from it or not. If it deviates, then it flags it. If it deviates too much, it blocks it. That's the monitoring where there's least amount of human intervention. So yeah, that's one of the growing areas and that absolutely should be done inside of an organization. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much, Sundar, again, for highlighting all these key security recommendations and that organizations can immediately just validate internally if they are using it very good. If not, they can add this as one of the roadmap items for moving forward in their organization. Moving on to another question, which is around, okay, I do, this is the last question, but then I just got one curious question if you want to share, yeah. right? What is that? that you are currently working on. For example, if you talk about vulnerabilities, so do you work with a specific customer use cases only or do you work, as I said, you work on the overall ping tool. So what is that you're currently working on? Is it a vulnerability that has recently been released? Have you find out, found out something and you're working on it? Kevin, is it something that you can share with us? Which right. component, which product uh, that you're currently working with? Yeah, I can share with that because that's anyways public. Yeah, the current set of tools that I work with are Ping1 DaVinci, the Ping1 platform, Ping Intelligence, yeah, Ping1 MFA, and some of the internal microservices of the Ping1 platform. Those are the okay. things that I take care of. Okay. There are other product security engineers on my team who take care of the other things that Ping1 has, the Ping identity. Okay. okay, great. Great to know all of this. I know a lot of people are familiar and they are using it. And thank you very much for making this product really safe for the organizations, right? Because of the regular grinding of product security engineers like you who was actually putting that extra step to make products secure and make it really valuable for organizations to use it. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, Sindar. Yeah. So, yeah. It's my pleasure. Moving on to the last question, which is what advice would you give to aspiring security professionals? who are interested in pursuing a career in product security engineering? I think it's a bit of a generic question, but again, like if you want to become a product security engineer, first of all, have developer experience, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's absolutely important. And once you have gained a little bit of a developer experience, start understanding traditional security, penetration testing, web application security, all the recommendations that OASP gives you, all the recommendations that, that you would ideally follow in a traditional pen testing setup like recognizance, right? And then probing. Well, once you're probed, how do you identify the vulnerabilities? Once you identify vulnerabilities, how do you write and exploit? All of those things, right? And then build a habit of persistence. And I keep telling this inside of the security career and at the end of the security career, at the end of the day, one of the things that affect us the most is a burnout, right? Because you can learn a lot you can try finding a lot of vulnerabilities. You can keep trying and trying. And there can be yeah. weeks, months, if not years, until you find something, right? Okay. So you've got no scope to be demotivated. Don't be demotivated. It's okay. Because security vulnerabilities are not like sprints that you have to complete. That You have to find five vulnerabilities in this sprint, right? That's an absurd claim. Mm -hmm. I can only find it if it is there. It's a very tiring job. Sometimes it can lead to burnouts. Sometimes it can lead to disappointments if we if you don't find too many vulnerabilities. But yeah, if you don't find a lot of vulnerabilities, if others don't find a lot of vulnerabilities, congratulations to the security engineers, you're doing a good job, right? So one of the things that I keep telling for budding ProtSec engineers is that persistence is the key, right? We have to be very persistent and very patient. Apart from all the continuous learning and keeping ourselves up to the edge of all the new technologies that are being developed on all things. Okay. So this was a really good insight and I hope this entire episode was very valuable. So for all our listeners and I really want to thank you again Sundar for taking our time talking to us and not just having a very high level but also we went through a lot of deep dive into different topics and right from the time where someone aspires to becoming a product security engineer to the time on how they can apply skills that they would need what would they do in day-to-day -day challenges this was a really a golden knowledge hour I would say that we I just spent learning from you so thank you very much, Sundar. I hope this becomes one of the best episodes that I have recorded so far and uh, people will be able to get a lot of value out of it. Thank you, Sundar. Yeah, thanks for having me on this podcast. It was a really pleasurable experience. Sure, thank you. And I hope I'll be able to do further more interesting sessions with you by picking up some interesting topics in the future. And, and again, this is just in general. I just wanted to talk on with you. So I'm trying to do a round table, Sundar, 
So mm-hmm. will you be interested to join us? I'm like I have Krish who was my first sale point consultant, right? My pod, first podcast guest. Then I have Sanjeev who is currently the head of India and a pack siders. Okay, yeah. and then I also have one my friend who is a senior manager, and then I want to invite you also, and one more that I am looking for. And there will be topics like mostly around I am product development, I am security, the whole life cycle, and I want to hear perspective from all four or five of them. So, is there something that I can also consider you for this particular roundtable in the future, yeah. maybe in a month or so? I'd, okay, okay. Thank you very much, Sundar. And this is something that came to my came to my mind like a couple of days ago. Like, why not have? And again, I'll do this once I'm done with all the individual podcast. Okay, so somewhere around the month of April, I'll be shooting the first episode, and let's see how that would go. But I really enjoyed Sundar, and I hope I was a nice host to you. So you I asked nice relevant questions, and I did not bore you. No, no, absolutely. No. But uh, anything that you want to add, any last words before we wrap up for today? No, the last, not quite a parting word because we are anyways, I hope mm-hmm. to do this again and again because I enjoyed the podcast so much. Thanks for having me here. It was really enjoyable. It was, it's probably my second podcast. If Okay. Yeah. I think the first one was not that serious after all, but this one was the first very serious podcast and I really enjoyed speaking about all the things that I do. And you are doing a great job, Ravi, because... A lot of people see security from outside and it may or may not look very exciting to them. Like security can sometimes be very exciting to people because it's like a cutting edge thing. It's a thing that people want to get into. But once they get into that, it's very difficult to establish your footprint in there because for the first part of your security career, you might not be able to find anything. Or even if you find something, those are like very minor issues or something like that. What you are doing is we're spreading awareness about that. We want to let our message out to the world, but we didn't have a medium for that. You are establishing that. So Rabbi, you are doing a great job with this podcast. And thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. And it's my pleasure. And again, the only purpose that I'm doing is mainly awareness. And I really want right folks out here in India and across to have a really great careers, not just get stuck into operations and the level one, level two roles. Because I've seen potential in a lot of the gang members that I call them gang members here in our community. And they have a great perspective. The only thing that they lack is the vision, like what to do next. Some folks will come to me saying that they have four, five years of development knowledge, three years of IM knowledge, Mm -hmm. and they are still working as an engineer. And I'm like, what are you doing? Come here, I'll tell you. And then I'll introduce them to an IM developer, right? Or again, one more roadmap that you've just opened up. Is a product security engineer. Yeah. And because they're right, if you see the only thing that they have to add is maybe a six months of good security course and they will be a great product security engineer, right? Or a great IM developer because they have spent four or five years in development and they are good developers. They have spent three, four years in IM, but again, clueless. So with this initiative, my purpose is like India should be a powerhouse of IM and security professional in the next couple of years. And if we are able to achieve that, and I believe every organization will be able to benefit from these things because I'm trying to make sure that through my tutorial sessions that I'm giving, the free IM session, I'm creating a base in everyone saying, this is the bare minimum you should know if you are an engineer or a specialist or anything, right? From a security and IM perspective. After that, you can move on and do whatever you want. Eventually, that would make or or take a lot of burden from a lot of service and consulting companies where they are still struggling to build that mindset in in the engineers and analysts that they have. So yeah. let's hope that our target is achieved and then every day, every week at least, I would say I hear all community members coming out and sharing their um, job success, right, that they are getting. Yesterday only one of them said that she got praised. So another peak in my, another feather in my cap. That's what I consider as an achievement for myself. Yeah, absolutely. Let's hope this it's a big achievement. Yes, definitely. If you're helping the community, nothing can be greater than that. Yeah. yeah. So thank you, Sundar, and have a great rest of the evening and hope we soon talk again. And I'll Maybe in a week, two weeks later, I'll share you the draft. Sure. Sounds good. Take care. Have a great rest of the evening. Bye-bye. Bye.